as the video said, feel free to flip on over to Genesis 31. Today we have 55 verses to read, uh, but don't worry, because today is a unique text. Today is, if I could put it this way, today's text is the summer blockbuster of Genesis. I mean, really, I was having a hard time this week drawing out spiritual principles because it seems as though the narrator is just fully indulging in the action of today's story. It is a high stakes encounter where Jacob is running off with his family effectively for his life while Laban pursues him. It is a really good story. So today we're going to be in Genesis 31 and uh, you're either going to want to read it from the screen or in your Bible. So feel free to flip there now. Now, before we read the story and before we jump into our text, I'm going to pray for us real quick if that's okay with you. Let's pray. Sovereign Father, we thank you and praise you for how good and gracious you are to us all the time. Uh, Lord, we just ask that you pour out your mercy upon our heads that we might see you for who you are through this text. Lord, I ask that you um, draw us into your story, that you fill our mind with the pictures that you would have us see from this text, and Lord, that you allow us to draw out the principles you would have us learn about yourself. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, before we jump into this morning's text, I need to share with you the context and the background. Today is Genesis's summer blockbuster. It is, effectively, if I can indulge in this for all the fellows in the room, this is a UFC pay-per-view fight night. Because what we have today is we have the final showcase showdown between Jacob and between his father-in-law, Laban. If you know anything about these two men, they're both greedy, they're both swindlers, they're both liars, they're both cheats, they're manipulators, and today is the final text in which these two men come face to face in a colossal battle, and the question that we're going to ask is, who wins the fight? Who gets the upper hand? Who, at the end of the day, outmaneuvers, outmanipulates, outcheats, outsteals the other, who between Jacob and Laban gets the upper hand. It's UFC fight night pay-per-view, all right? Welterweights, because I bet they were thin desert boys, all right? You guys track it with me? The question we have as we jump into today's text is, who's going to win the fight? Who's going to get the upper hand? Jacob or Laban? Let's take a look at the text. Genesis 31 reads like this. Now Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's, and from what was our father's, he has gained all his wealth. And Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him with favor as before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field where his flock was and said to them, I see that your father does not regard me with favor as he did before. But the God of my father has been with me. You know that I've served your father with all my strength. Yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not permit him to harm me. If he said, the spotted shall be your wages, then all the flock bore spotted. And if he said, the striped shall be your wages, then all the flock bore striped. Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. In the breeding season of the flock, I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream that the goats that mated with the flock were striped, spotted, and mottled. Then the angel of the Lord, then the angel of God said to me in a dream, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift up your eyes and see all the goats that mate with the flock are striped, spotted, and mottled. For they, for I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now arise. Go out from this land and return to the land of your kindred. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us and has indeed devoured our money. All the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do. So Jacob arose and set his sons and his wives on camels. And he drove away all his livestock, all his property that he had gained, the livestock in his possession that he acquired at Padan Aram, to go to the land of Canaan, to his father Isaac. And Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole her father's household gods. And Jacob tricked Laban the Aramean by not telling him that he intended to flee. 
and he fled with all that he had, and he arose and crossed the Euphrates and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. When it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob had fled, he took his kinsmen with him and pursued him for seven days and followed close after him into the hill country of Gilead. But God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream by night and said to him, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. And Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country, and Laban with his kinsmen pitched tents in the hill country of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, what have you done that you tricked me and have driven away my daughters like captives of the sword? Why did you flee secretly and trick me and did not tell me so that I might have sent you away with mirth and songs, with tambourine and lyre? Why did you not permit me to kiss my sons and my daughters farewell? Now you have done foolishly. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night saying, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. And now you have gone away because you longed greatly for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? And Jacob answered Laban and said to, <clears throat> answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. Anyone with whom you find your gods shall not live. In the presence of our kinsmen, point out what I have that is yours and take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent, and into the tent of the two female servants, but he did not find them. And he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the camel's saddle and sat on them. And Laban felt all about the tent, but he did not find them. And she said to her father, Let not my lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the way of the woman is upon me. So he searched, but did not find the household gods. Then Jacob became angry and berated Laban. And Jacob said to Laban, What is my offense and what is my sin that you have so hotly pursued me? For you have felt through all my goods. What have you found of all your household goods? Set it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen that they may decide between us two. Now these 20 years I've been with you, your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried. I have not eaten the rams of your flocks. What was torn by wild beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. From my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or by night. There I was. By day the heat consumed, consumed me, and, cold, and the cold by night. And my sleep fled from my eyes. These twenty years I have been in your house, I served you fourteen years for your two daughters, and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages ten times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands, and he rebuked you last night. Then Laban answered and said to Jacob, The daughters are my daughters, the children are my children, the flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. But what can I do this day? For these my daughters, or for their children, whom they have born. Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there by the heap. And Labar, Laban called it Jagar Saradadahutha. All right, that's my best guess at that word. But Jacob called it Galid. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore, he named it Galid and Mizpah. For he said, The Lord watched between you and me, and when we are out of one another's sight. If you oppress my daughters, or if you take wives besides my daughters, although no one else is with us, see, God is a witness between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, See, this heap and the pillar which I have set between you and me. This heap is a witness, and the pillar is a witness, that I will not pass over this heap to you, and you will not pass over this heap and this pillar to me to do harm. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac, and Jacob offered a sacrifice in the hill country and called his kinsmen 
to eat bread. And they ate bread and spent the night in the hill country. Early in the morning, Laban arose and kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned home. I almost could pray and send you home right now, right? My voice is shot. That's a long text, but fortunately for us today, it's a pretty short message. The question as we approach this story is, who's going to win the fight between Jacob and Laban? Now, before we jump in and summarize the contents of the story, it's, it's helpful if we familiarize ourselves with the context of the story to remember where these men came from. We first actually see uh, Laban in uh, the Genesis text. And if you remember anything about the character of this man, it's brought up in Genesis 24 that we see he's a greedy man. If you remember, Abraham sends a servant over to Laban's house, and we're told that Laban gets excited. Laban gets off the couch. Laban runs out to this man when he sees the bracelets and the rings on his sister's, if I'm not mistaken, on, his, on Rebecca's arms. The man is a greedy man. But we'll later go on to realize that the man is a stingy man. How so? If you remember this, when Rachel comes out to water the flocks of uh, of her sheep. Notice this, we're told that she's a shepherdess, which means what? Her dad has put this woman to work. He's that cheap that he won't hire people. Why hire men when I have a daughter? I'll use my daughter to be a shepherd out there. This is a greedy, stingy man who's always conniving. But Jacob is his own version of a greedy, stingy man. If you remember, Jacob's introduced to us in 25. The first thing we see him doing is he's fighting in the womb. The second thing we see him doing is as he comes out of the womb, he's still wrestling with his brother, specifically grabbing his heel, which is what his name means. Jacob means heel grabber. He's a wrestler. He's a contender. He's a manipulator. He's always looking to trip somebody up so that he can get on top. And this is fleshed out in his character. For the first real story that we saw him in, Jacob is manipulating his older brother and getting him to sell him his birthright for a pot of stew. Here's his brother, hungry from the hunting field, famished, comes in, and Jacob says, no, I'm not going to feed you unless you give me something. But both of these men, the fullness of their character is on display in what they're probably most notably, um, probably their most famous stories. For Jacob, we see that his character, this man is a liar. Because you remember the story. Jacob goes in to steal the blessing of Esau. It's Isaac, who's blind in his tent, who wants to give the blessing to Esau. But Jacob literally clothes himself as his brother, puts goat skin on his hands and on his neck, and goes in there and lies to his blind father. Literally, we're supposed to see that he pulls the wool over his father's eyes. Jacob is a liar and a manipulator, and from that, he walks away, quote-unquote, blessed. But Jacob isn't the only one who lies in the latter portion of the Genesis text, we see that Laban has his own web of lies that he sows as well. Because in the same way that Jacob deceives his father in the darkness of a tent, we see that Laban deceives Jacob with the Rachel and Leah switcheroo on the night of Jacob's wedding. If you're not familiar with the story, effectively what happens is Jacob comes to Laban, who is his father-in-law, and says, I will serve you seven years for your beautiful daughter, Rachel. And Laban says, what is it to me that I give her to someone else? That's not a problem. Yes, I'll take and accept your terms of uh, arrangement. But after seven years, Jacob comes to his father, says, give me Rachel. And in the night, after probably lots of drinking on behalf of Jacob's uh, part, and having heavily veiled Leah, he switches the two. And Jacob, thinking he would wake up beside his beautiful Rachel, wakes up beside the less than attractive Leah. The Bible's words, not mine, okay? <clears throat> in the same way that Jacob lied to his father, Laban lied to Jacob. He pulled the wool over his eyes. This is the context of the story between these two men. Always contending for the upper hand, always trying to put themselves in a favorable light, always trying to bless themselves, always greedy, always stingy, always trying to win. Then we enter into <clears throat> the text at hand. What we read last week is the story begins with Jacob is finally fed up with serving for Laban. 
uh, serving Laban for his daughters. So after 14 years of serving this man, he says, hey, I want to go back home. But Laban says, listen, 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 you don't have to head home yet. Come and work for me. Uh, just name your wages. And so Jacob names his wages. And he says, I will serve you for your spotted and speckled sheep and goats. At the end of my tenure with you, whatever sheep are spotted, whatever goats are speckled, I will take them. That will be my wages. That's what I'm going to work for you for. And Laban agrees. But what do we see Laban do that same day? He took all the speckled, all the spotted sheep and goats, and he ran them off to a field to where Jacob could not touch them, i.e. Jacob could not mate them and produce more speckled and spotted sheep. What we see Laban do is get the upper hand over Jacob by taking away, effectively, his wages. He wants to keep Jacob in, an, in a posture of indentured servitude. He's keeping this man's wages far from him. Uh, Laban cheats and gets the upper hand on Jacob. But what does Jacob do? You remember the story? You saw it last week. Though Laban somehow steals all the sheep, we see that Jacob remarkably is able to still breed all the sheep and goats. Through this strange, weird breeding pattern that we looked at last week, Jacob sets up some sticks, he marks the sides of his cattle, and somehow, <clears throat> by the grace of God, we're supposed to see that Jacob still gets the upper hand in the fact that he can somehow produce speckled and spotted sheep, and he amasses a ton of them. So much so that you just saw it in today's text that the sons of Laban get angry at Jacob because they say he's stealing our livelihood. He's taking all of our goats, all of our sheep. We have to do something about it. And that's when Laban's face changes towards Jacob. His words are still for him, but his face is against him. And that's when Jacob realizes, I got to get out of here. In fact, the Lord comes and says to Jacob, as we just read, Jacob, go back home. Now, how's Jacob going to get home? How's he going to get his effectively four wives, 11 children, back home without Laban noticing? Well, that's when Jacob um, hatches up another scheme, another plan. I made the argument last week that what we just read today was Jacob lying to his wives in a field. If you remember, repetition is the bread and butter of Scripture. So every time you see an inconsistent repetition, you can recognize that a character has changed something. We're told in the text that God comes to Laban, and, or sorry, God comes to Jacob and simply says to him, go return home. But by the time Jacob communicates this to his wives, how does the story change? How does it alter? Ah, my wives, last night God came to me and visited me in a dream. He said, Jacob, and I said, here I am, Lord. He said, I am the God who's been protecting you. I'm the God who helped you with these sheep breeding patterns. I'm the God who's looking after you, and I'm calling you to go home. So, sweetheart, ladies, I want you to follow me back home because I'm blessed by God. He's called me to head, head back home to run away from your father. And what you just saw in today's text is both of the wives say, if that's what God said, that's what we'll do. So Jacob, in the early portion of today's text, gets the upper hand on Laban in the fact that he's able to convince his two wives, two concubines, 11 children, a million camels, a zillion goats and sheep to head out under the cover of darkness effectively and run off through the desert to try and get away from his father-in-law Laban. We're told that this happens when uh, Laban goes to shear the sheep. This would have been a festival. It's a bit like, um, you guys brand cattle around here, right? And I'm told that it's quite the ordeal. You know, you bring them all out, the whole family's there, and then you go brand them and have a good time doing that. And then that makes you hungry for some reason. You really want to eat, right? And so you guys have a big cook-off thing. Have I heard this? Is this true? Yeah? Schrader family, am I right about that? They're like, nope. All right. <laughs> but Laban goes to shear the sheep, and so Jacob says, at last, it's finally our chance to get away. And so Jacob takes his family, and you're supposed to see, one of the reasons I didn't want to do pictures this morning is because, really, I don't think there's a way to... The only way you could appropriately visualize what's going on here is to take a look at like a movie like Gladiator, right? Where you have just this colossal desert scene of people running away and then people pursuing. I mean, this is a huge ordeal. This is a height of Genesis drama right here. He's got all his family and it's don't tell the father-in-law, don't let anybody know, and now it's let's go. And they try and pack everything up and they get a three days lead. And it looks as though Jacob finally has the upper hand on his father-in-law. It looks as though he's finally tricked him. He's made it across the Euphrates. Finally, we're going to get to the promised land. But oh, what happens? 
Jacob is unsuccessful in taking his wives away, and Laban catches up. These are running camels, by the way. All right. You have no idea how long and how hard, how long it was to draw, how hard it is to draw a running camel. I'm telling you right now, that, you're welcome right there. All right. <clears throat> Jacob takes off, thinking he gets the upper hand, but what we're supposed to see is Laban is right behind him. Laban doesn't have to worry about two wives, two concubines, and 11 children. He just takes his men, effectively, on their war camels to ride after Jacob, and he overtakes him. And effectively, what we're supposed to see is that he surrounds him, and he's about to pounce on him. Remember, in the mind of Laban, Jacob is still a slave. And in this case, he's a runaway slave who, by his own admission, has taken his wives and his grandchildren by the sword. That is an offense in the mind of Laban that is punishable by death. This is a harrowing experience. This is a run for your life, sweetheart. I don't know if I'm going to make it out of here. And finally, Laban catches them, and Laban circles them. Jacob thinks he has the upper hand, but Laban comes and captures them. And at this point we effectively see that Jacob is either going to be killed or drugged back into the home of Laban where he's going to continue to serve as a slave. But what happens? All of a sudden, God shows up. And he saves Jacob from Laban by specifically giving Laban a dream saying, when you interact with Jacob, don't speak to him good or bad. That's effectively just like saying, it's a, it's a Hebrew, uh, Hebrewism of basically saying, don't do anything to him at all. Which, from what we can tell, Laban still says some pretty harsh and mean things to Jacob, which means the intentions of Laban, like he will later say, is, it's in my power to do you harm, i.e., it's in my power to kill you or to enslave you, but... Golly, last night in a dream, God came to me and said, don't do anything. The last time, God, you basically used the same phraseology with someone was with the uh, Abimelech in his dream after he was persecuting Abraham. And do you remember what God says to Abimelech in that story? He says to him, Abimelech, you're a dead man. You are a dead man. Don't you dare say anything good or bad to Abraham. So Laban has the fear of God in him. Jacob has been spared by God coming down and saving him in a dream, effectively. And it looks as though Jacob has the upper hand. God is on my side. And what you begin to see Jacob do is to climb up on his high horse, or to climb up on his high camel, if you will, and he begins to berate Laban. I told you that God was on my side. You've changed my wages 10 times. That's basically, when you say 10 times in the Hebrew, it's basically like saying, you changed it a dozen times. It doesn't mean he actually changed it 10 times. It's just, you changed my wages all the time. I had to work for you seven years for one daughter, seven years for another, six for your flock. You have been a jerk to me, but God has been on my side. So Laban, you cannot touch me. Oh, and by the way, those stupid, silly gods that you're looking for, they're not here. They're not in camp. In fact, if you find them in the hand of any of the members of my camp, you can kill that person. And that's when Jacob sets a trap for himself. Because Jacob does not realize that the one thing he came to acquire in Padam Aran, his wife Rachel, has these household gods effectively in her pocket. And Jacob says to her, says to Laban, whoever you find with these idols in hand, you can kill them. Jacob thinks that he has the upper hand, but he does not realize that Jacob has just set himself up for disaster. Because as you saw in the text, Jacob was unaware that Rachel had these idols on her person, effectively. And so we're left to wonder what's going to happen. This is when the story slows down. This is where things get super intense. You see Laban get off of his camel, and first he goes into the tent of Jacob, because that's where they are. And if I find them in Jacob's camp, I, in, <clears throat> in Jacob's tent, I can kill the man and eradicate him by his own words and by his own admission. God himself will not be against me, for I have agreed to the terms that Jacob has set. But he doesn't find him there. Then he goes to his least favorite daughter's tent and scrounges around in the dark to try and find these idols, but he cannot find them there. Then he goes to his favorite daughter's tent, and he scrounges around in the dark. We see that he is, it says that he is um, 
fumbling around in the tent. Effectively, we're supposed to see that Laban is groping in the dark, trying to find these idols, but he does not find them there. So he comes out of the tent, and there he finds Rachel. Am I not mistaken that she's sitting on a camel at the time? For some reason, I always picture it this way. Is that right? No, saddle? It does say saddle? Yeah, perfect. Awesome, cool. On a camel saddle, I guess. I don't know. Comes up to his daughter. <clears throat> and if there's anything that Rachel's learned over the past several years, and first being underneath her father, who's a cheat, and now her husband, who's a cheat, she figures out a way to lie to her father so that he will not come and pat her down. She says to dad, um, it's my time of month, and so I'm not going to get off my horse. Is that okay? And Laban does what every father does in a situation like this. Says, ah, don't ask, don't tell, I'm sorry. Yep, you're good, I'll see you in a little while, right? And he begins to back up slowly. And Rachel effectively lies to her father. And what you're supposed to see in the text is Jacob had just put his wife's head in a guillotine. And all that is required for that guillotine to fall is for Laban to find these gods. Jacob had set his wife up for disaster. Jacob had set himself up for disaster. The one thing that Jacob wanted to acquire in Padam Aran, the one thing we're told that he ever loves in his life is his wife, Rachel. And he just said, if you find idols on her, you can kill her. And she has idols on her. But by the grace of God, God not only saves Jacob from Laban, God saves Jacob from Jacob. And the gods are undiscovered. Laban repents of his folly, blesses his grandchildren, and he sends Jacob on his way. What you're supposed to see in this text is remember the journey. Jacob has been on this journey before. He came into this land with nothing to his name. The man was sleeping on a rock. He used a rock for a pillow because he did not have a tunic to his name is what we're supposed to see. He arrives in Padam Aran in the house of Laban, a slave and a beggar. And he is walking out of this region, a prince. And we're supposed to ask the question, who won the interaction between Laban and Jacob? Who had the upper hand? Who was the ultimate, man, who was the ultimate victor in the situation? Who in this story has the upper hand? And the answer to the text is, God is. Because in every single interaction between these men, they only ever in, end up deceiving themselves. Every action they take to bless themselves ultimately only hinders themselves. Jacob tries to run away, but effectively puts himself now in the debt of Laban where he and his family can be killed. Jacob gets on his high horse and says to him, if you find any gods in my camp, you can kill the person who has them, unbeknownst to him that his prized wife has them effectively in her pocket at that time. This man is shooting himself in the foot. Laban is shooting himself in the foot. Neither man in the story what we're supposed to see. Neither man can see. Neither man is capable of saving his family. Neither man at any given moment in this story ever really has the upper hand. The only one who sees in the story, the only one who can save, the only one who has the upper hand is the Lord. Does that make sense? The question is, is who wins in the battle between Jacob and Laban? And the answer is both of them continually lose because both of them think that it is they themselves who will end up blessing themselves. They think the only thing they'll receive in this life is the stuff that they fight for. But what you're supposed to see throughout the entire interaction is every single time these guys fight for something, they only end up fighting against themselves. Each man is deceived in the dark. Did you notice this? Laban is the one who deceives Jacob in the darkness of a tent. And now what do you see? Jacob was pining for the gods of his heart, i.e. Rachel, in the darkness of a tent. And now you see Laban pining in the darkness for the gods of his heart, and he cannot find them. 
Both men are blind. Both men can't save. It, there's even a play here on these gods. Notice this. Uh, Laban's gods can't see anything. Laban's gods can't save anything because Laban's gods cannot be seen and Laban's gods can't even be saved themselves. Here, what you're supposed to effectively see in the text is that God is flexing over the household gods of Laban because God is effectively saying, your gods were just conquered not only by a woman, but a woman at a very hard time season in her life. Effectively, your gods were conquered by the curse that I gave the woman. Your gods can do nothing. I see, I save, I have the upper hand. I am the God that is Yahweh, and I bless, is what you're supposed to see in this story. Does that make sense? So the question that this text has for us is two. First one is for Jacob, and it's this. Jacob, when are you going to learn that you will be blessed not because you manipulate, not because you cheat, not because you steal, not because you lie, not because you control. You will be blessed because God promised you that he would bless you. You will be blessed because of what I've said. Second question is the same, but it's not intended for Jacob. It's intended for the audience. It's intended for the reader. It's intended for you, which is this. When are you going to realize that the way in which you are blessed is not because you can manipulate, because you can cheat, because you can bribe, because you can put yourself in a favorable light, because you can get the upper hand over your neighbor, your sister, your friend, your mother, but simply because you can trust in the word of the Lord, which says, I will bless you. The question of the text is, Jacob, when are you going to learn? The second question of the text is, when are we going to learn? When are we going to stop conniving, stop angling for, stop manipulating, stop controlling in order to have ourselves be blessed? God says you'll be blessed because I said you'll be blessed. And everything else we do in the meantime only hurts or hinders us or those around us. Does that make sense? Question in the text between the two is, who wins, Jacob or Laban? The answer to the text is, God wins every time. He's the only one capable and the only one who actually has, at the end of the day, the upper hand. That's the story, Genesis 31. I'm going to pray for us. And we'll jump into some more worship. Sovereign Father, we thank you and praise you for how good and gracious you are to us all the time. Lord, we thank you for what this text teaches us, which is not something foreign to Genesis. It's something we've seen before, Lord, but you know that uh, we need the repetition. Because, Lord, so often in our lives we think that the only blessing that will ever come our way is the blessings that we fight for, we cheat for, we lie to, acquire. But, Lord, your text teaches us that all those things are done in vain. And the only thing we need to do at the end of the day is trust in your word. Trust in you and the blessings that you provide. So, Lord, I just ask for myself and for my brothers and sisters the next time we are um, tempted to give in to manipulating a situation or a person, circumstance, or words. But, Lord, we simply relax, we let go, and we trust you, recognizing Blessings come not from the things that we take, but from the things that you give. Power is by your spirit to see these things, to worship you accordingly. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and jump into some worship.